Should I remove all my breaths? Are they too loud? Are they too soft? What in the world? I get in all this conflicting information. Do I keep breaths? Do I take them out? Do I make them bigger? Do I make them smaller? Can the tech help me with my breaths? There's just so many options and so many contradictory suggestions out there. This episode of Audio Barnyard is gonna take you through the best practices for having great breaths within your audio. It is another episode of the Audio Barnyard Podcast with Don Barnes. I'm Donnie Barnes. We are brought to you, as always, by VO Jumpstart, where we show you how to create better quality audio faster. And you can do that, of course, at VOJumpstart.com. So yeah, today we're talking about breaths. And there is, as Don said in her intro, so much conflicting advice and schools of thought regarding breaths and audiobooks and voiceover. And a lot of people get confused about this. So, Don, I know this is the kind of question you get all the time, especially in your private sessions. You do a lot of one-on-ones with people. What are what are some of the things, some of the misconceptions you think that have developed around breaths these days and where the industry is going in regards to what people should do with their breaths in their recordings? Well, I get a lot of people that are taking them out. Uh, I get a lot of people that are leaving them in. They listen. To, first off, they'll post something in a Facebook group and they're going to get conflicting information. It almost drives you crazy. There, there are some people are saying, well, I like mine without any of them. And I, oh, mine are way too loud is what I hear all the time. And then, so let's back up. The industry is going, it's, this part is undisputable. We can, we can talk around the edges about a lot of things, but the industry is going towards something that's considered, quote, more conversational. So if we're just talking voiceovers, well, I guess I should ask you, you've done tens of thousands of those things. What are your clients saying? Are they asking you for something that's very authoritative or do they want something more conversational these days? Conversational has been the buzzword for several years now for voiceover clients. They tend to want natural, uh, very human. Uh, in fact, the, I get a lot of voiceovers that specifically request that I not sound like a voiceover person, that I not sound <laughs> quote unquote announcery. Okay. So yeah, it's, that, that has been the trend for a long time now. Okay, and so there's some exceptions. There's gonna be, be some of you that are doing this in this business and your specialty is that type of voiceover that we might've heard five or 10 years ago and there's a huge market for it, no stress. You do you, that's great. But where the industry is going, and if we're working on audiobooks specifically, and we're a narrator, well, characters have to breathe. Taking out all the breaths and the characters don't make any sense, and people still like a nice, warm, natural sound. So I'm just gonna say blanket. The industry is going toward much more conversational. I can find exceptions. I can find a client that wants something different. But I also can tell you categorically from talking to so many people that where it's going is more breath. So more does not mean asthmatic or erotic breaths, okay? We're not doing erotica where you need lots of breathing. We're not talking about that kind of stuff. But most characters need something. <gasps> That's too much. Don't do that. You do not want to call attention to your breaths. But then we have a whole very interesting conversation that comes up about it. And that's, well, what are you going to do about it? Or what should you do about it? If you're going to do an audiobook, you can take out an occasional breath and you can lower a breath a little bit. Like, and I actually have this little mental roadmap. If I'm lowering breaths more than about six dB, it's too much. And then what it really means is if, I, if I'm doing too much, bringing too many of them down, then that means I need to go ahead and do some practice or I need to talk to my client about, hey, you know, there's some practice things you can do that will bring your breath down to a reasonable level. And then people ask, well, can't you just do that with the tech? Put in a de-breather, <laughs> okay? Uh, yes, sort of you can, but most of them do not sound very good. And I just, uh, an aside, most of the de-breathers that are out there that are traditionally called de-breathers were originally designed for singers and musicians, but you know, having somebody singing within a song, you can have something that the breaths don't need to sound natural when you're done because you're gonna have music in the background. And when you apply those to spoken word, they're inconsistent because they were not designed for that purpose. And every once in a while I'll get a voice where that worked pretty well, but most of the time it's like, ah, you know, a third of the breaths, I just don't like the way they end up sounding because that tool was not designed to do that. It's the old using a hammer to pound in a screw type thing. It, it kind of can work, but it's not optimal. Yeah. And because so many words that we speak have breathy sounds in them, any kind of automated breath removal or breath control 
is likely going to take out some parts of the words too, which is why, again, those are tricky, right? Oh, they're very hard to get set right. And here's, if you're doing an audiobook or you are a narrator, on book A, you can get it dialed in because that those characters have a certain range that they're in. And book B, you have different characters, which are just naturally, they're different characters. They have a different accent. They're from a different region. They have a different intensity and a different feel behind them. And if you adjusted your your D, D breather to work on character A, a lot of times character C sounds a little funny or has big breaths or, or, or smaller or overdoes it. It's really hard to get it dialed in. Now, if I'm always doing the, I, I get to do me most of the time. So that I would be easier because I'm not trying to do character voices than somebody like Donnie who has to act so much in so many different ways and be really big sometimes and really gentle, laid back, you know, and those, those, the, that diversity means the automated tools have a very difficult time with somebody who has a big range in terms of their characters, in terms of their voices. Uh, they're just not designed for that. Yeah. And, and another issue with just taking out all breaths, trying to create quote unquote breathless audio. Uh, if we're, if we're concerned about AI voices and sounding as human as possible to distinguish ourselves from AI voices right now, well, guess what doesn't have any breaths? AI voices. So the more, the more we have natural sounding breaths in our, in our audio, the more human we sound. And that increasingly is an asset and it's probably going to become even more of an asset going forward. Yeah, I can tell you, an aside, uh, back in the day, uh, drum machines came in and, and drum machines were so strict about the way they did things and they didn't have these little human elements so that when you heard them, if you were a musician, you could always tell that it was a machine. Now, over the years, they've added in some things to make it sound much better. And today they can do that very well. And I predict in the AI, I predict that they will over time try to figure out how to add breaths because they will want to match. Because if they don't do that, they will never sound as good as you can, as good as I can, but as good as you can and as personable as you can. You just can't be warm without some breath. So best practice, don't take out all your breaths. You might have an exceptional client that wants some in there, but overall, don't take them out. Number two, the tech is very difficult because of what Donnie said earlier. There are words that have a breath sound within them. And if you get all your breaths between words down to the point where they're gone, it will be taking things out of the words and they won't sound natural. Then number three, you can learn to do all this with performance if you choose. Yeah. And so how does somebody work on their natural breathing to sound better and more natural when they're in the bo in their booth working on their voiceovers? Yeah, I love this concept of booth breathing. OK, matter of fact, I love this concept that you can't booth breathe. So uh, you will hear people go, well, just when you're in the booth, you know, work on your breathing. Don't breathe so loud and that'll work. And I'm always thinking, ah, you know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm just going to say I'm 60. Um, I've been breathing my whole life. Nobody. I don't remember once anybody and and. You run your little Rolodex here. See, see how, see if you can remember. Has anybody ever said to you, wow, you really breathe loud or you really breathe quiet or you really breathe great or terrible? Or I, I don't remember anybody ever saying a single word. Anybody to you, Donnie, ask you, mention how your breathing is just so wonderful? <laughs> I, I've not gotten many compliments on my breathing throughout <laughs> okay. my life, unfortunately. So here's the deal. We've all been doing it our whole life. And to get good at it, it is brain dead simple. It is some of the simplest practice you could ever help somebody with to teach them how to breathe comfortably and have quiet breaths. It's also some of the hardest things I've ever done as a coach to help people do it because of the minor side effect, which is this. I have 58 plus years of breathing while talking. I'm over 60 and I'm just rounding. And so I'm going to assume I started when I was two. So, that gets, so if I walk in the booth and I try to change my breathing, it's just a really hard thing to do because I have all that experience. And let's say you and I sit and we do an exercise for two minutes, five minutes, two hours today. Then, okay, well, then if you talk to your dog or your spouse or your friend or somebody tomorrow at lunch and you spend an hour talking with them and you don't do any of your re breath reduction type things, you, then you negate almost all your practice by just having a normal conversation. And we all have more normal conversations most days. And so cumulative, cumulatively, boy, can you say that for me, Donnie? 
cumulatively. Yeah, that word. It's very difficult unless you become very conscious of it when you're in your regular life. And forget booth breathing. I'm just going to go on record and saying, unless somebody practices outside the booth effectively and consistently, they cannot go in the booth and then consistently do it. And I, my wife's a singer. Most of you know that. Donnie's mom's a singer. And my wife's a singer. So it's all the same person, by the way. Amazing coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way that works out. So when, she, when when we started in this business seven and a half, eight years ago, Donnie got us started. She was used to going, <gasps> and because she can maintain these super long phrases. And, she, and a singer, really, I don't want to say they get paid for being able to do long phrases, but it is the mark of a good singer where they have this great control and this great posture and they take in tons of air and there's music going on 98% of the time, so nobody cares. But it turns out that that works beautifully in singing. So she starts doing this. A mic is six inches away. What is she doing? It's a habit. She went to school for it. She grad This is her degree. She spent years and thousands of hours learning to go. <gasps> and then producing a really great sound. And, and that's fine. But it doesn't work when we're in the booth. So here's a couple things we need to do. Let's start with exercise number one. The first thing people need to make sure is that they're not breathing through their nose. <sighs> I don't care. It just never sounds good with a mic six inches away. It, in real life, nobody cares. But when a mic is sitting so close to us, does it's really hard to do that very effectively and very quietly. I'm not saying it's impossible. You can do it, but it is a very difficult thing. And I don't recommend that that's what you work on. In the booth, we're going to work on having our mouth open. And you can practice this. So here's practice number one. Take in a breath that is quiet as you possibly can, and it does not need to be quick. So let's take a breath in. Donnie, you can do this with me. So it's going to go something like this, and then we can do it together. So we're doing. Now, hopefully you don't hear very much of that, all right? It should be very, very quiet to yourself. Just you open your mouth like you're yawning. And that's the perfect example. A yawn is a perfect breath in uh, as long as it's not a loud yawn. You can actually yawn very quietly and very discreetly. And you want to do that and you want to go and just get comfortable with doing that for a little bit. And you have to practice that. Just taking a breath with your mouth open. But then you can do the same thing without your mouth being really wide because it's really about opening your mouth and your throat. And you can do the same thing with your mouth not so uh, open, but you can end up doing it something like this where you can't see me going, but you can, you can hear. It's just gentle. It's comfortable. And start working on being comfortable with a breath with your mouth open. And you really need to do that. Now, here's the secondary thing. And then we'll get into the kind of uh, the, the part that, oh, any questions about that, DB? No, I, that's good. I had the same thing that the, the same sort of habit that my mom had because doing sports broadcasting for a lot of years and I still do it. But if you're in the middle of a, a long, exciting play, you know, it's hard to take a break from that exciting play and take a new deep breath. So you learn to take a deep breath and then go for a long time on that. So that was something that I had to break when I first got into voiceover as well. Yeah, it happens for a lot of us. And really, and it might happen for you in that it's just the way you might have learned to, to talk. No one teaches you, hey, you have quiet breaths when you're a little kid. No one even thinks about it. It doesn't matter. Now it matters. So here's the next step. Now when you're in a regular conversation with your wife, your spouse, your dog, you're on the phone, you're doing anything where you're talking to another person, or you're in the shower by yourself talking, you're in the car by yourself talking, they'll just think you're on your Bluetooth as you're talking on the phone. You use those opportunities to start talking and taking deep breaths that are comfortable and not loud with your mouth open. And you need to do that now. The first, here's the first exercise I love giving people. Next time you're eating dinner with somebody that you know, and you're having a regular conversation, because it's not a critical conversation, you're, you have the ebb and flow and it's comfortable, learn to take a nice, gentle breath while you're having conversations with others. That is the key to becoming good at breath control and if you can't do it outside the booth, you almost will never do it consistently within the booth because we'll go back to our normal habit, whatever we've been doing, in my case, 50 plus years, Donnie's case, 35 plus years, whatever you, however old you are. So you are going to practice with the people you're with in regular life outside of the booth, taking very gentle breaths. And you can get really good at it. Now, here's the trick. They can't know you're doing anything at first. So the first couple of weeks you're doing this, 
You need to be stealth about it. Don't tell them you're practicing your breathing. I don't want my wife to know. I don't want her to go, what's wrong with you? I mean, she could say that for other things, but not for my breathing, not when I'm doing breathing exercise. And if I need to, in the car. Secondarily, the, one of the best things you can do is start practicing your tongue twisters. Now, most of us are working on different, Donnie will tell you, <laughs> it's embarrassing. I mumble. So I, as I stumble over words, he points them out to me later, go, oh, you said Pennsylvania and you put it all together, whatever. Or I hear it while I'm editing or I hear it later. And I have a tongue twister list. And we'll talk about that in a future episode. One of the, some of the tongue twister practices that you can do to be better at this. Because while you will not see me as a model for enunciation, pronunciation, and a lot of things, you did not hear me 15 years ago. If you did, you'd be proud of me, okay? <laughs> even five, even five years ago, you you have. I mean, he has for you at home. He's gotten remarkably better. Yeah. Well, and I grew up uh, a single mom who really didn't help me with English, and and really, you know, was busy providing a great environment for us to grow up in, and and she was working a lot. So there wasn't anybody around me when I was a young guy going, well, you should pronounce it this way or that way, or it just didn't exist. Point being. Now we're going to take all those things and you can do some tongue twisters. So you can say things like Swiss wristwatch, Irish wristwatch, Swiss wristwatch, Irish wristwatch. You pick your own phrase. That's a great phrase, by the way. But you pick your own phrase. And what you do is you say it until you can't say it anymore and you need to take a breath and you take your quiet breath and you can do it. You can slow the breath down short term so that it is you're, you're doing your little tongue twister slow, comfortable breath. You're doing your tongue twister until you're out of breath, slow, comfortable breath. And then you work your way into your tongue twister, quick, quiet breath, your tongue twist, tongue twister, so I'm gonna, tongue twister, 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 tongue twister. So you see, I, I stumbled over that phrase. Pick, find your phrase that you're stumbling over. You do it until you run out of breath and then take a comfortable breath in and then do it again and string it together. Now, if you're keeping, but we'll, we'll, we'll have an episode on, on some things I do about tongue twisters because I have a whole technique for practicing those. And I teach other people how to do them and it's really your tongue twisters. Do them as long as you can. When you run out of breath, comfortable breath. Then the next one that we'll have is your conversations now with everybody around you, normal conversation, quiet breaths, and it doesn't matter. Even if I'm going to be intense about my speaking, I still don't need loud breaths. And, and the real key is when you go into your DAW and you're looking at them and you're analyzing, if you need to bring it down more than three D, uh, 6 dB, then that's probably you're not, you haven't practiced enough. And this practice, here's the hardest part about it. Two days from now, most of you that watch this will not remember that you're supposed to be practicing your breath because that's normal. That's what happens to everybody. You have a life. You're worried about 400 other things. We've got all these other things going on. And to remember, so here's your assignment. You find yourself a way to remind yourself on a regular basis to do some practice with breaths every single day. And if you can do this for a month or two, you'll be blown away at the results and how much you don't need to rely on the tech, how much more comfortable your read will be, and how you don't need to think about this in the booth. If I have to think about it in the booth, it means that I have not practiced it enough outside the booth. Because once again, I don't believe in booth breathing. I don't think you can do it. And I don't, I don't want to say you can't because somebody, you know, anybody can do anything they want. But I have 50 years of doing it one way. And to think that I'm going to walk in and for a half hour or 10 minutes or a one minute read, change the way I breathe when I really should be focused on what feel is this script? What message am I conveying? What emotions are supposed to be happening during this read, not how am I breathing? That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and I would say too that after you you practice your your natural breathing throughout your everyday life and you feel like your natural breathing is better and has improved, you might have to play around with your posture in your booth to get that to translate into your your reading life. Because depending on how you are, how your bone structure is, what body type you have. Like my sternum actually cuts way further in on my chest toward my lungs than a lot of people's does. So I actually have to, I found that when I really want to sound relaxed and conversational or when I'm doing some long form e-learning type reads, I will literally sit back in my chair and I do it in a way that 
I'm sort of open and expansive, so I'm not hunched over and I'm not cutting myself off because cutting your, your, your lungs off, that'll force you to breathe loudly more than a lot of other things. But, you know, a lot of people, some, some voice coaches would cringe at the idea of ever leaning back in your chair to speak. For me, my particular body type, how my bone structure works, when I want to sound super relaxed and conversational, that's, that's much better for me. Other times when I want to sound much more uh, upbeat, energetic, engaged, maybe I do have uh, a voiceover where somebody wants me to sound announcery, I'll absolutely lean forward and be on the edge of my seat and, and be really straight with my posture. So sometimes playing around with your posture and body positioning in regards to the microphone and how you're standing or sitting can help smooth over that breathing, can help change your breathing a bit after you've taken the time to really work on it in your everyday life outside of the booth. Yeah, it's something people can do. And I've had so many people be successful. So you have a combination of things. You're going to work on your voice when you're not in the booth. You're going to work on your tongue twisters until you run out of air, you need a breath. Then And then you're working on them in everyday life. And then go ahead and figure out, sitting back's better for me for this feel. Sitting forward on the edge of my seat is better for this feel. Occasionally, now, so some people stand 100% of the time. And I think for a long time, Don, I, you had years of standing during all your voiceovers, didn't you? I didn't have a choice for a long time. I was recording in a tiny little closet early okay. in my career. So I, I couldn't sit down even if I wanted to. So I just got used to doing it that way. It wasn't until I moved into a better room where I had the option to sit that I started being able to play around with those different positions. Yep. So depending on your circumstance, you may have to you know, find something that in terms of your posture to, to suit whatever environment you're in. Now, most people do learn. I, you will get a couple of coaches that say, no, 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 you, can, you always need to stand. I, I know too many really great narrators who are doing long form. And I know some commercial voiceover people that sit 100% of the time and some that stand 100% of the time. So just you do you, okay? There's no, don't let somebody else tell you you can't do one or the other. You can do either. Just make it comfortable. And practice, practice, practice. I do have one guy, a little aside. I have one gentleman who I thought was brilliant. He took his smartphone and he had it play a little beep once an hour. And he was a little nuts. He had it somehow he could shut it off at night. But all throughout the day, once an hour, it would beep. And I go, why are you doing that? And he's like, because it beeped once in our session. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I heard it more than once. It's like, what's going on? And he says, oh, it's my reminder for that breathing exercise we were talking about. And when it beeps, I remember, you may need to find a way to do that. And after you've been doing it a couple of weeks, you can turn around and now talk to your spouse, your friends and say, hey, I'm working on something. And I, if you hear me breathing really loud, just you know, throw something at me, throw a piece of bread at me or whatever. A dog bones really works really well, but something to remind you. But really, the real trick is you find a way to remind you. And I'm going to leave it with this one other thing. If you are, are the one who's evaluating your own breaths, nine out of 10 times, you're overhearing them. With the same sort of thing as squirrel. Uh, once you start seeing squirrels, if you're, you know, my dog sees a squirrel, my cat sees a squirrel, man, they're right there. But it, once we decide that we're listening to them and we're listening in a nice, quiet environment, we're going to hear squirrels and we're going to hear breaths. <laughs> All right. It's just natural that once I'm focused and this is the one minor problem, everybody's taking out usually more than what they need. Who Sometimes I do think, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be down. It'd be good down just a little bit. And they're taking it down a lot. And I ran into a gentleman yesterday who was just taking it down. It's like, whoa, the proportions are just you don't need to take him down that much. And he was doing so much. The other thing is, by the end of the year, he won't get as many performances in because he's now editing out all this other stuff. And if you're going to do that, that's where you hire an editor, okay? But make sure you pay him well enough because it takes him a lot of time to do that. So you don't need to do that. You can solve it with your performance. You can make it a much better and reduce how many breaths you need to take out. And I know now, first off, I don't edit any of Donnie's. I haven't for years. But if he gets a really high profile gig, sometimes he'll run it by me and I'll go through and make a couple of tweaks to something. We'll collaborate on something. It's pretty rare anymore. I, I see I see maybe I'll bet a half a dozen a year at the most right now. And when he sends those to me, I kind of realize, oh yeah, I don't have to deal with any of these breaths anymore. I don't have to deal with all these things because he's built it into his performance from performing a lot. And your goal is as you're performing more. All these things get better and better and better and better. You can deal with having breaths be more comfortable because you hear them and your performance solves so many issues. So that's our focus. 
but that's also hard to remember when I'm not performing to do the right type of practice to make it work in the performances. Yeah, just like we all tend to hate the sound of our voices early on, we all tend to hate the sound of our own breaths and we get very self-conscious about them. 99 times out of 100, your audience and even your clients aren't going to care about your breasts. Occasionally, you'll run into one who's obscenely picky about it and unrealistic about it, but the vast majority couldn't really care less. So if your breaths do have an issue, if they're wheezy, if they're asthmatic, if they're squeaky, we can work on that. Otherwise, your breaths are probably fine and you can still improve them by working on it every day in everyday life, as Don said. So we hope you found this episode helpful. Be sure and like, subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know how helpful or if you have other questions or even disagreements. We're always happy to hear those, too. You can leave that in the comment below. Or if you're uh, listening on your podcast provider, be sure to leave us a rating and a comment as well. We do appreciate that. As always, if you're looking for a ready-made system, a setup, processing stack that can increase your audio quality and dramatically cut your editing and processing time, including your time editing breaths, <laughs> we can do that over at VO Jumpstart. Dot com. Head over there and set up your free 15-minute session with Don and see if he and the programs we have would be right for you. Until next time, for Don Barnes, I'm Donnie Barnes. This has been the Audio Barnyard Podcast. You have a great day, and of course, we'll see you on the wires. Bye-bye.